half in the bag. Well, Mike, this is sort of uh, an impromptu half in the bag. What do you mean? We've been sitting in this house for almost 10 years now fixing the same VCR. Oh. What is a half in the bag? We weren't going to talk about Comic-Con stuff, but here we are. Is Comic-Con finally over? Uh, you mean like forever? No. It'll never, ever be over. Although I think attendance is down. I think people are losing interest because it's nothing but a big advertisement. It's a media hype machine. It's the only reason it exists anymore. It used to be, you know, you would go there and actually look at comic books and maybe there'd be one has been. Lou Ferrigno would be there. So those days are long gone. Those days are long gone and now it's just Disney trying to shove their dick up your <laughs> But we weren't going to talk about Comic-Con, and we weren't going to talk about Midsummer, uh, And now we're just going to talk about both. I normally don't really pay attention to Comic-Con stuff, but... We did a video last year about stuff. It was only a year ago, but it feels like a lifetime ago. Mm. Because there's been 27 comic book movies to come out between then and now. Yeah. That's when Marvel but, uh, dumps all their, their corporate projections. That, that screen of, like, the, the lineup, it's very, like cold and yeah it well, feels it's, like it's you're at like, a boardroom meeting. it's like what we've talked about with the like star wars celebration should we that, should we give a, a cynicism warning like people have trigger warnings we'll say if you don't like it when we're negative maybe shut this off now uh, well yeah. <laughs> i have one trailer i want to talk positively about everything else is like an exhausting nightmare speak for yourself um i am too exhausted to be exhausted Okay. I just don't care <laughs> one way or the other. So we, well, we have this problem where if we talk positively about something, whatever the most recent thing is that we talk positively about, the comments are, you guys give a pass to everything. And whenever we're negative about whatever the most recent thing is we're negative about, the comments are always, you guys hate everything. Mm. So I don't know how we can be both, but we are. Uh, but today we're talking about Comic-Con. Um, to I, me though, the, the sheer volume of stuff, uh, kind of is indicative of the fact that there is an audience for all this material. Sure. And there are winners and there are losers. And it's very like, it's very free market. Mm. Uh, it's just like, I, I was kind of looking through the list and I'm like, okay, there are shows that I didn't know existed that are in their fifth or sixth season. Uh, the Flash season six, Riverdale season four, Young Justice season four, Doom Patrol Season 2, Titans Season 2, Supergirl Season 5, <laughs> Arrow Season 8, Black Lightning Season 3, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 6. I thought that show was done. Ending with Season 7. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, so it's like, and I'm looking at these things, and these are all live action. Yeah. I think all of them are. Uh, Young Justice sounded like a cartoon show, and I, I think that might be a cartoon show. I don't know. Um, uh, but it was like, okay. And so, uh, yeah, and then I, I, out of curiosity, I looked up some of the, the things that ended. Uh, uh, Luke Cage. Netflix doesn't seem to have a very good track record with superhero TV shows. Well, they, they've said, I don't know if it's just superhero stuff, but in general, they, uh, there was some sort of quote recently where someone that works for Netflix said they don't see any need to have a show go longer than two or three seasons. Mm. So I think they, so they, they create a new show to drum up interest, get some new subscribers, and then once they get it, they have no use for that show anymore. I agree with that. So unless it's, well, I do too, because then it's like, oh, good. It's like I still haven't watched Mad Men because it's like eight seasons, and I'm like, ugh. I would like to watch it, but it's a lot. So yeah, two or three seasons is perfect. The only exception to that is like uh, Orange is the New Black and like Stranger Things, like the really popular ones. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, because there's Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, um, The Punisher, Daredevil. And then there's a couple of Fox flops, The, <laughs> the Gifted. I don't know what that is. Which I, I think was an X-Men thing. Like really? X-Men branded, The Gifted. It's like teenagers with superpowers. I've never heard of this. Uh, and then Gotham. Well, Jay, since we're going to talk about the San Diego Comic-Con stuff, uh, I thought maybe we could start with Star Trek Picard mm. so I can get that out of the way. Got a lot of thoughts about that. Sure, yeah. I mean, you probably have a lot to say about it. Like, I, I really don't know hardly anything about Star Trek. Like, I know it's different than Star Wars. I think I saw a trailer for Discovery. Like, I'm, I'm vaguely aware of who Picard is. Like, I've seen the GIFs. You know, the make it so, I've seen that. It looks like it's from an old TV show, which looks different than the new show. So I, I don't know. That... Mike, 
What? 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 I was just about to tell you about Star Trek. Oh, yeah, Picard, yeah. yeah. We were going to talk about the new trailer for Star Trek Picard. Engage. It's a trailer for Star Trek Picard. What did you think about it, Jay? I, I, I understand people are excited now because the trailer looks good. But it does? What I, are they excited about? I don't know. I guess just seeing Picard and seeing the old Star Trek uniforms and, hey, there's seven of nine. Well, oh, okay, so... We talked about Star Trek Picard when we did a predictions video, right? Yeah. Or no, we had did an alternate idea video, basically. It was called Star Trek Galaxy. It was kind of like a what would we do situation. Yeah. There's, there's, there's two things going on here. Alex Kurtzman and a changing Star Trek audience. Uh, all right, let's, let's address Alex Kurtzman. I, I, I have heard that like his involvement has been lessened behind the scenes, but that doesn't matter because by the time that happened, they had already been well underway in working on this show. And, and, and Kurtzman will already have his horrible, horrible fingerprints all over this thing. I know, I know they got rid of him. And but here, so this, is like, this is like Star Trek Discovery Season 2, right? Alex Kurtzman started these horrible ideas, and then I have a strong suspicion that other people at the end of it had to try and fix it. I think it's the opposite. I think other people started potentially good ideas. <laughs> And then halfway through, Alex Kurtzman came in and ruined it all. In any case, he is involved and he's going to ruin it. The other thing we're talking about is like changing fans. Like Star Trek, to me, used to have nothing to do with like action or even being cinematic. It was just philosophical ideas, science fiction ideas. It was extremely nerdy. Well, yeah, the, I mean, and there was a mixture of, of uh, the Gene Roddenberry's original vision was the boringest thing ever, <laughs> right? It was the cage, which, yeah, of course, yeah. in Star Trek Discovery, they had to remind audiences what the cage was. And NBC said, that's too boring. We want a Western in space. So then Gene Roddenberry had to kind of change it up. They had really good stories. And, and to me, they were mostly horror stories. Uh-huh. Uh, I've said this before, where th they beam down to a planet and some nightmare scenario <laughs> occurs that they have to get out of. It wasn't always super heady and philosophical. No. It was a lot of the time, but a lot of the times it was also, here's a science story. This, you know, Captain Kirk has been split into two different people via a transporter accident. Uh, they're searching for this thing. They're, they're trying to figure out this mystery. This guy's gone crazy. Um, there's a lot of that. There was a lot of action-y stuff. Um, they were limited by their budget, of course. They wanted to do, but it was just overall good storytelling. And then in the Picard trailer, I saw a kung fu kick, and I was out. Yeah. And look, it looked decent. I mean, it's a quality-looking trailer. But then she kicks someone. A woman kicks someone off a balcony. I'm like, no. No. Well, the second they said, she's the key to everything. I was out. Yeah, oh yeah. She has no idea what she truly is. She's the end of all. She's the destroyer. It looks like Picard, the character, was dropped into Star Trek Discovery. More so the, the terrible writing part, because they started off with uh, promising people a thoughtful, dramatic show. And we joked about that. You said, you don't believe them. I don't believe them. Right off the bat. Um, where it's like, okay, Picard, what does he do in his retirement years? He lives on a vineyard. We're gonna explore his character, isn't it? And then immediately, they go for this big science fiction stupid I premise. am the chosen one by destiny. Sort of, it's more like uh, Firefly meets uh, Logan meets the Fifth Element. Yeah. Like, it's just like stock plot elements, which was really very sad to see. Uh, because it's it's the most lazy, pathetic form of writing, and I can't believe people are falling for it. It 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 might be good. Like we're going on one trailer. That's the thing. We're going to keep an open mind until we watch. I'm going to watch yeah. the premiere, and that's it. I, but I, I I I know what it's going to be. But I know Alex Kurtzman is involved. Yeah. And I am still extremely, extremely wary. There's a 1% chance it'll turn out to be something that's unexpected because you watch the trailer and you know that a bunch of people who don't know anything about Star Trek said, what do we know about Star Trek? Picard, the Borg, eh, eh, eh. 
let's have a young, Picard can't kick people, let's have a young girl in there, a young woman who's half Borg, she's, she's the chosen one, she's, she's the key to all this, she will be our undoing, it's, it's so tired. And, and of course, let's tie the Borg in, Picard, we drag him out to space, it's everything we said will, will happen because it's the, it's the baseline stupid kind of thing you could do with Picard. They don't know how to explore his character. Yeah. Because his character uh, was intentionally very guarded. He was not K Captain Kirk. Mm -hmm. He was a very private man. And he did not like people. <laughs> he did not like children. He was a quiet, intellectual man. Once you take that guard down, what's in there, Mike? I don't know. I don't know. They, they explored his character many times in Next Gen, and it was always just little kernels of things. He was a fine character if you're going to have an ensemble show, and he's just kind of the centerpiece that holds everything together. Which is, which is what our suggestion for Star Trek Galaxy. Because, <laughs> um, you know, you have a classic character, you have a Data, uh, you have a Spock, you have a Worf. Yeah. Most of those kinds of characters have that dichotomy to them, yeah. where Worf is... is a Klingon in a human world, Data is a, a android trying to understand people, Spock also. When we demonstrated our superior weapons, they should have fled. You mean they should have respected us? Of course. Mr. Spock, respect is a rational process. Did it ever occur to you they might react emotionally? Uh, he's trying to have no emotions, but he has to be around humans who are filled with emotions. You know, so there's that dichotomy. Picard was he was a very private man, and he was very diplomatic, and he was very well read, uh, and very closed off when it came to his emotions. When he said goodbye to Riker after serving with him for 20 plus years, they shook hands, and they, they did a slight nod, well, and Riker left. They did not hug each other, right? and Picard went right back to his thing. He did not give two fucks that Riker just walked out of his life forever. That's why the, the, the real ending of Star Trek The Next Generation was just him coming to join their weekly poker game for yeah. the first time. That was a, that was a huge moment that's for a him. Huge moment, yeah. so when, <laughs> I'm just going to hang out with my friends. I, I think that's the inherent problem here is, is people love Picard. Modern day audiences, meaning younger people, people under 30 know, they know the Make It So, they know the Picard shirt thing. Uh, they know all that stuff, uh, they know the Borg, but really Picard is, is not the centerpiece of a show where you want to delve into the emotional arc of your main character. I'm not going to say you can't do that. I'm not. I'm not going to say there's not a writer out there you who's going to mine Picard. You need top tier writing. You need top tier writing and we have Alex Kurtzman. Yes. It's going to be garbage. Alex Kurtzman, who wants to do a, 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 a 14 episode space arc story about. And then he has no idea what he's doing. He's going to say, hey, what if there's some young girl who's really special? And then the other writers are going to say, well, who is she? And he's going to go, just do it. Part Borg? Borg? <laughs> I had a thought, because it's, kind of, it's kind of a dumb idea. What if she's Data's daughter? Oh, I've seen, Lol. I've seen that. Is that, yeah. that a fan thing she, that's already happened? She looks nothing like Lol. No, but who gives a shit? Just do it. Just do it. I think, okay, there's six or seven stupid Lol things was, you can do. My, Lol was rebuilt by the Borg. Yeah, okay. That's why she looks different. Uh, 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 pick, it's just like a deck of cards you smear out <laughs> on the table. Just, okay, it's, it's, it's Lol. Let's put some Borg parts in her and make her an assassin, because that's <laughs> stupid. Um, or before, um, before Captain Janeway blew up the Borg Queen, because um, we have seven and nine involved, yeah. the Borg Queen uh, had a child incubating in an incubator, no, and she's my... the child of the daughter of the Borg Queen. Wait, that Stu thrown out stupid ideas here. What do you got? They tried to merge the Borg Queen with Lol to rescue the Borg Queen. Okay. All right. I'll take it. That's fine. It, <laughs> audiences don't care as long as there's explosions <laughs> and giant space battles. Uh, I know the trailer doesn't look like that necessarily, but Alex Kurtzman is writing this. We, we get a he little... Was, he's involved with this. Yeah. So just, just grab some components and put them together. Whatever gets you to uh, space 
mercenaries in black leather eight, flying eight, around and punching each other. 8,000 fighter ships, because that's a thing that should totally exist in Star Trek. Whatever gets you to 8,000 fighter ships and a Borg cube that's the size of the sun, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This Borg cube is 100 million, billion, trillion times bigger than the other Borg cubes, because Alex Kurtzman has a big and, and I, he drives around a Lamborghini, <laughs> right? My Borg cube's bigger than your Borg cube. Um, so then we also have a guest appearance by Seven of Nine, which everybody freaked out, because remember her? It's Seven of Nine. She's gonna have one episode cameo where she shows up and kind of nudges Picard to go off on the mission because the Borg are bad. You remember, you were Locutus. <laughs> Resistance is futile. Remember? There's something you could do with them interacting that could be interesting. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna poo-poo ideas for the sake of them. I know they're not, any, any, they're not gonna do anything good because Alex Kurtzman. But yeah, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Seven of Nine interact with Picard. They got, there is some Borg connection there. That's fine. Seven of Nine's, this is other, this is our other card. Seven of Nine's daughter. Uh -huh. Seven of Nine's daughter. Her, oh. her, last we saw Seven of Nine, she was in a relationship with Chakotay. Uh -huh. In the alternate timeline of the final episode of Star Trek Voyager, Chakotay had died, but Captain Janeway went and fixed the past. Yeah, yeah. Chakotay uh, probably eventually died, because they're, maybe they're not going to get Bob Beltran back. <laughs> Uh, he's he's off, uh, he's it just, off playing golf. It just didn't work out between it them. It just didn't work out, but they had a baby together, and because Seven of Nine was a cyborg for so long, some of her board components, oh, I know, uh, nanoprobes made yeah. their way into yeah. her eggs. Yeah. Her female lady eggs. And they went, and so <laughs> she has she has a child that is, that is, it is the first of its kind. It's a first of its kind. It had nanoprobes in the egg and and that made a super human Borg American Indian hybrid. <laughs> Borg Queen's daughter. Uh -huh. Borg Queen's daughter mixed with the DNA of Lal. <laughs> Seven of Nine's daughter. Uh, make, uh, uh, part Borg hybrid. Uh -huh. um, it can't just be some random girl. It's got some sort of story time. And her only point in the show she can sense where the giant Borg cube is. That's it. And Picard, he was once a Borg. He was once Locutus. So come along with us on this secret black ops mission by section 31 to take this little girl or young lady. Because everyone she, knows about section 31. She looked very young. Um, I don't know how old the, the actress is or the character. It just it's happened so fast. I don't know if she's a teenager. It looked like she was. It, it's like the Logan premise, except for she's a little older, right? Mm. Take her out to space to find Super Borg Cube before it gets to Earth to bloat up Earth. And, and they'll have uh, some stupid stories where people kick each other and punch each other. And eventually the Borg Cube will make it to Earth where 50,000 Starfleet ships and, and 150 billion Starfleet fighters all shoot at the Borg cube at the end. Mike, why are you so cynical? Our prediction videos are always so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that Kung Fu kick was great. Well, that was a good talk about Star Trek Picard, Jay. I thought so. Considering I don't really know anything about it, I did my best. I didn't know you were so passionate. Oh, I don't know anything about it. Were you listening to me? Yes. Engage. Anyways, let's talk about other things that were revealed at the San Diego Comic-Con that we weren't at and we'll never go to. No, we were there. Remember last year when we said we were there and there were people in the comments that didn't realize we were joking? That happened. I, Even I, though, because we showed some B-roll from other people's footage uh, and there was absolutely nothing to indicate that we were really there, there were still people that thought we were there. I, I was tempted to uh, respond, because I, I don't know if this was the first year that Ghost Adventures was there. <laughs> they, they, had a, they had a room. And oh. They had their they had their cell phones stolen. I saw. Oh really? They set up the official Ghost Adventures iPhone on a tripod to film their panel. Oh, like to stream it or something? Yeah, to film it just so they could post it later. Oh. And somebody why were they stole filming it. it on an iPhone? I don't know. I was. That's what I was asking. It was like, does, doesn't 
the, the, their budget is that low. But I mean, isn't like the the, the San Diego Comic Con like hardwired for like audio and video and like? I have heard that they don't allow live streaming, which is interesting. I think it's because they want people to to be at the events or to to like tweet about the events. Yeah. The, the attendance it's like, dropped by a ninety five. Yeah, exactly. Everyone would stay. Oh, I'll just watch it online. I'm not going to go. People go to stand in long lines. It's true. And they go, they go to stand in the back of Hall H where they can't see what's happening and just applaud when they hear other people applauding. Jay, my favorite pastime is waiting in line for 16 hours. To I, hear, to I hear people that. Uh, that are working on a project not say anything of note about the project, just that it is a thing that exists. I love standing in lines to be advertised to. I, I love being like, like a farm animal herded <laughs> into a room to be used as a, as a pawn in a hype machine. Yeah. That the group excitement, mm -hmm. a cheering crowd, uh, it's like people doing the wave. Yep. It's a cheering crowd, you lose your sense of individuality, you lose your sense of objectivity, mm -hmm. of um, being able to look at something and go, I may or may not like this. Me. Wait, are you talking about Comic-Con or politics? I'm talking about both. They've oh, merged. Okay. <laughs> They've merged completely. <laughs> um, so when, when that kind of, when you're in that atmosphere, yeah. you're more likely to cheer and to be excited about something yeah. than if you were just, if you're sitting and watching someone's political speech by yourself, it's probably, you're probably going to have a different reaction than if you're in a room with people holding signs and cheering. Sure. Then you're more likely to get swept up in the hype of it all. Mm -hmm. And that's what, exactly what the Comic-Con does. And it's very good at it and it's very effective because then you, you get that sneak peek, you get that early access of this thing that's going to be huge. You go online, I just saw the trailer for this, and you didn't, and it's fucking amazing. Yeah. No one in that room for any trailer, I can guarantee, is going to go, eh. I'd be curious, maybe someone in the comments can answer, has there ever been anything at Comic-Con that got booed? But we're not, we're not, uh, shitting on anybody's excitement over things you can get excited all you want. Don't care. Yeah. We're just talking. But that is a problem. Uh, the idea of people, when you express an opinion on something and people take it personally because yeah. they have invested a bit of their personality into this pop culture thing that they enjoy. That is a problem. And if you don't... Like what you want, don't let it define you as a human. Uh, and that's part of the problem, too, with, like, the, the hype machine and Comic-Con and especially, like, Marvel and DC, maybe more so DC. Look at me. I like ghost hunting programs. Yeah, and you don't care that everybody calls you an idiot for it. Right. I enjoy that. <laughs> um, so we're not, we're not uh, trying to, to squash anyone's dreams. Isn't it weird that we have to have a disclaimer for that? Like, we're going to discuss some trailers and things that are coming out. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. I, I think... I think we should replace the term man-child or man-children with just children. <laughs> because grown-ups are now children. That's true. Who yell at each other yeah. about their playroom. <laughs> and their, their playroom is their, their comic book movies and TV shows. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's fairly bizarre. It is. It's creepy. The, the United States is, is it's just door is wide open for us to get conquered by some other country <laughs> because we have a generation of people who are yelling about Batwoman. <laughs> uh, come on in, tanks. <laughs> you will not get a fight from anyone under 40. You put out, Marvel can put out all these movies. Well, that's that's People we should go, watch we should go into to yeah. Marvel because that's they're in now. We got Avengers is done. Now they're in like sink or swim mode because now I feel like they, they uh, first of all I think they should have waited and they can't do it because the money machine has to keep rolling. But wait like three or four years after that Avengers movie before you make another fucking Marvel movie. Oh yeah, because yeah. it's like we just saw Avengers. Spider Man came out. We didn't see it, but now immediately there's this announcement of all this new stuff. And even before, I saw people were posting pictures before they were announcing the titles, when it was just like Marvel logo and a date, yeah. and it was like a dozen of those or whatever. Untitled, untitled. I just saw that image and I was like, fuck. It wasn't excitement, it was an ooh, I can't wait to see what they do next. It was just, we just did this. 
Yeah. I can't wrap my head around being that excited for something that just wrapped up. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. It'd be like if, I mean, the Hobbit movies kind of sucked, but it'd be like if those came out like a month after Return of the King. Right. You know? It's like, oh, we're doing this again? Yeah. It's, it's, it is hard to wrap your head around, and it's hard to get excited about it. Um, and, you know, we're speaking from non-comic book, diehard comic book fans, but I think... But we are generally fans of most of the movies Marvel has made. We've liked a lot of them. I keep hearing good things about Spider-Man Far From Home, and I just don't care. This isn't even, it's not like, oh, it's the sequel to Spider-Man. It's like, oh, we've already seen Spider-Man four fucking times in the last two years. Yeah. You know, in all these different movies, so it's not just a sequel to Spider-Man. So there's that problem. And it's like, the first thing they announced was that Black Widow movie, which is like, first of all, good for Scarlett Johansson. She's been hanging around with these, these weirdos for a decade. And she's always got the short short end of the stick. Yeah. Gets her own movie, but it's like, oh, we just saw her die. Oh, now she's got her own movie. Like, yeah. immediately. Right, right. Uh, I mean, if you like spy stuff, maybe? Because, I, 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 you know, she's an assassin or yeah. you know, something. David K. Harbour's in it. He's, oh, is he? Yes. He's from, like, the, from the hit film Hellboy? Right. Yeah. From Hell, he's most known from Hellboy. The, the, the one I'm kind of interested in is the Doctor Strange movie. Mm. Because from what I understand, it's just going to be a flat-out horror film. Which is how they dipped into the gothic and the horror and the, and the horrific, and we're going to make the first scary MCU film. Yes! yes! Even the title is an allusion to, like, cosmic horror H.P. Lovecraft stuff. Yeah. Um, because that's why I was interested in that New Mutants movie that just vanished from existence. Because that was just, like, a straight-up horror film. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, and then that got lost in the shuffle of... Fox getting bought out by Disney or whatever. Then there's something called Shang-Chi. I don't know what that is. I think it's supposed to have... Who is that character in Iron Man 3 that everybody said? Oh, the Mandarin. The Mandar I think the yeah. Mandarin. It's going to be, be, I Mandarin. guess, the real Mandarin, because in the movie it was a fraud, yeah. which was an interesting twist, and everybody hated it for some reason. I wouldn't mind... I, I think... I don't know what Shang-Chi is, but I think I would be excited about, like, a martial arts... Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon with superpowers kind of movie. Sure. I think I'll be excited sure. about that because it's so much different than cosmic space alien lasers and yeah, robots. Yeah, yeah. Um, the early Marvel movies were, you know, it was just like Iron Man and Captain America, and then they started to go into the cosmic stuff. Yeah. And now it feels like after the Avengers movies, like scale it back mm -hmm. or go in a different direction. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of what they're doing. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm looking for silver linings. <laughs> because I don't care about Loki. The only thing people were excited about, I guess they were excited about just products, more Marvel movies in general, but the biggest announcement, I guess, was they, they, they came up to Natalie Portman's house with a truck full of cash and convinced her to come back to the Marvel Universe because she left, she was done with this shit. Do they have like a crane that just lifted a pallet? <laughs> beep, beep. Just dropped right it. into her front yard. Yeah, so she's playing female Thor but I saw the news headline that says Thor 4 is coming out and Natalie Portman will be playing Thor. And I saw, is that an Onion article? Is that a joke? Like, <laughs> Natalie Portman is going to be Thor? I, I just don't know how it'll work. Uh, she is a very small statured lady. Uh, Rich was telling us that she will have cancer. Yeah, that's that the story in the comic, comics. is that she has cancer, but and then she, you know, wields the uh, the the hammer, and then she yeah. becomes, she has strength again. She's, but she, she, it's not just going to be Natalie Portman wearing, like, a Thor helmet. I have no you know, idea. She's a short lady. It'll be comical. And she's not, like, like a, you know, like a female wrestler or bodybuilder. She's not, so is it going to be like Adam when he holds the sword up? By the power of Grayskull. Mike, she doesn't have to be big to be a superhero. People of all shapes and sizes can be superheroes. Look at all these images of all these previous Marvel superhero characters. If it has a weird premise like that, like she's a cancer patient, and I think Rich said when she picks up the hammer, all of her like treatment for her cancer gets reversed. Something like, like her, that, yeah. And, and if, if it's like Natalie Portman and, and she really just doesn't want to be Thor, but she's bestowed with this power and she has to solve this this plot, uh, defeat this bad guy. And yeah. It's, it's less of a... I mean, because Thor was good when he was fish out of water Thor. This drink, I like it. I know, it's great, right? Another! But 
Natalie Portman like having no interest in being Thor, but has to save yeah. the world, it would just kind of mix it up. Well, the other, speaking of horror, the big one is Blade. They announced Blade, oh, right. which... Reboot Blade. Yeah, uh, which would probably be PG-13, don't care. Uh, Mahershala Ali. Yeah. Who, oddly enough, is on the third season of True Detective with Stephen Dorff, and Stephen Dorff was the villain in the original Blade. Oh, my God. So. Six degrees of Mahershala Ali. <laughs> it was great in season three of True Detective. I haven't watched it yet. Fine choice, fine casting choice. We'll see. I'm just a little worried that's going to be PG-13. You got a vampire hunter. You got people getting, you know, stakes driven into their heart. And it's just like a kiddie movie. Eh. You know what they need for Marvel? They need... You know, you know when Disney would release movies uh, under Touchstone? Oh, they, yeah. They well, up. I think they've talked about they doing that dark to make R-rated movies, but the Blade one is going to be uh, an official MCU movie, oh. so it'll be PG-13. Boring. But I think Kevin Feige did say he was interested in doing more of like Deadpool-type movies, but those would be separate so, yes. I don't know if anything. I don't think anything's planned yet, but because Deadpool, you got a problem. Yeah, now that that's owned by Disney, you, you got little what do you kids do with that it? like Deadpool, and they really haven't seen it. And well, they tested the waters with the second movie. They did that re-edit, uh-huh. the PG thirteen re-edit. Once upon a Deadpool. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I didn't see that, but I was I curious it. about that. But yeah, you need that sub label. Mm-hmm. The um, the the, the Marvel sub-label. After Dark. Marvel After Dark. <laughs> Here, that's that's great. <laughs> What was there was that Marvel brief Back period page. of time like the uh, the Ghost Rider movies and there was like something else that had their own separate yeah I don't remember what that was yes. even called it was only like two or three movies that were R rated I think one of the Punisher Warzone movie uh, and that was like a separate entity but I don't remember what it was called yeah. it didn't last long Marvel After Dark Marvel After Dark Marvel Back Page oh okay Back Page that's just the company name. Okay. See the back page of like magazines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sleazy advertising. That's where all the all the sex hotlines. Sex are. hotlines. Yeah. Yes. Marvel sex hotline. Well, that's a different label. That's where we oh. start getting the Marvel porno parodies. Oh, oh, that's a way down the line. Yeah, yeah. That's when they get really desperate. I like the back page. Mm. I'll make a logo here. Oh. Rated R. Rated R. <laughs> And then that little logo, you know, they flip through the comic books and mm-hmm. the logo becomes the Marvel logo. That's just like flipping through sex ads. <laughs> That's all very interesting. I think we enjoy talking about the, uh, the business side of all this. Yeah, I, I find that interesting. It's more interesting than the actual movies, yeah. usually. I could see the equivalent of this kind of internet show mm-hmm. and Two people talking more about oh, she, can she wield Mulliamir? Oh more, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Like, Who gives a fuck? Like we we just talk about like well, how they're going to market this. Yeah and, yeah. and I think I think that's what makes us so boring. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's why people get angry at us. Oh okay. Because we're we're not into the the lore. I guess I am more with Star Trek. It, it depends on what it is. Like I I I'm invested in the characters and the continuing storyline of like Guardians of the Galaxy. Sure. I like those movies. I like those characters, and I like that they have kind of more of a, an emotional resonance than a lot of the other Marvel movies. That's all I care about. All these other movies, I could, I could, I could leave. Yeah. Unless there's something that just pops, you know. Yeah. Every now and then that'll happen, and I think that's the good thing with Marvel is like you'll have like the Thor Ragnarok. Is that some sort of protoplasm? All the stuff that's coming out of you, or are they eggs? It looks like eggs. Because Thor 2, that, that was like, oh, God. That was one know. that everybody hates. There, was, there yeah. was some time, there was a couple of films, and I think Iron Man 2, people didn't like that one either. Yeah, yeah. That had the guy with laser whips. Mm-hmm. Um, and Until so he disappeared from the movie for half of it, for no reason. Sure. Um, but and then it was like, oh, there's some sequelitis happening here yeah. and there. And, and then, then every once in a while. Yeah, something will okay. pop out. Or you have something go. like Black Panther, which I know we were both just sort of like, eh, it was okay, but obviously that worked well for a lot of people. Yeah. That was a big one. The, the question is, with all like the main characters that people have spent so much time with, with them gone now, are people going to accept these new characters? Are these movies going to hit the way the other ones did? It depends on if there, if fatigue, the 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 fabled Marvel fatigue, ever yeah. sets in. If there is a every bubble bursts, mm-hmm. the housing bubble, the tech bubble, uh, every bubble bursts eventually. 
Um, that's just I think the that's way why I things. was so exhausted just hearing all these announcements because yeah. it's like, give it a couple years, let people miss it, and then you bring it back. But we can't do that anymore. Stupid for that. Yeah. Um, uh, so they're going to hope that this bubble doesn't burst. Eventually, it will. Will it burst before the new Avengers? fight the new Thanos eventually in their big showdown. Will people get sick of it and move on to something else? I'm, I'm surprised it's lasted this long. But again, it built up to Thanos, so that was like, yeah, it kept escalating. Awesome. Where I, it goes from here, trends, I don't know. Trends change, yeah. tastes change, you know, like 80s hair metal bands. Boom, Nirvana changed the music landscape to 90s alternative. Yeah. Everyone goes this way. Marvel superhero movies, suddenly everyone may go this way yeah. and run after this thing and, and enjoy this new type of movie. It's like the Matrix, you know? Like mm. that, that, was a big, that was a big watershed moment. Oh, sure. And that spawned the whole... And then you had a decade of action yeah. movies with people wearing trench coats. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so it's possible that the, the Marvel fatigue will actually happen. To me, it feels like it might. Yeah. But that goes into our our thoughts about streaming services and, and yeah. the, the endless opportunity to show all this material. That, that's almost a discussion too big for uh, yeah. to include in a Comic-Con discussion. But yeah, like uh, Marvel is putting a lot of their eggs in the, the Disney Plus basket, a streaming service that hasn't even started yet, but I can't imagine it will fail. It's no. Disney. Yeah. Disney's huge. They got so much content from a hundred years worth of you know stuff they've made. It's probably a safe bet, but I, I, they ha how much money do you think they're dumping into all these shows? Yeah. And it's like CBS All Access. Like, Discovery's not doing great, I would imagine, but they just keep dumping money into it, right? The, the finances behind it, the financials behind it are, uh, we can't possibly. You can't wrap your head around it. It's like Netflix, too. Uh, Netflix is doing, the only TV show I want to mention briefly is the Dark Crystal TV show. When you look at every little detail in the Dark Crystal, those things are the apex of somebody's art. That's not a property that's continued forever and they're just, we're doing another one. That's like a movie that came out in the 80s. It flopped, even though it's a fantastic uh, movie on a technical level. And it's like Netflix realizes, hey, there's probably an audience for this. Let's make this show. And it looks great. I think I can make an analogy to these streaming services. Okay. Because uh, before, like, you know, you'd have like, uh, in the era of Christopher Reeve, right? You'd have Superman on the big screen, yeah. and then you'd have your TV, and there'd be a TV movie, which were always cruddy, yes. right? And that's it. That's all you have. <laughs> now the spectrum has changed. And I, I watched the trailer for Batwoman, and it looked like, like a TV commercial mm -hmm. for like yeah, a cell cheap. phone company right. or something. It, I was like, oh, that's a show. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, DC has an app? The shows look cheap, uh, and and then I discovered there were like eight superhero shows on there I've never heard of. Yeah. So then Doom I'm thinking, Patrol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, these these are things. So I was thinking, the shows look cheap, probably because it's an app that has hardcore DC fans only, mm -hmm. which is a small group of people. And then I thought, wow, this is very. This can be attributed to music, to uh, a band. That DC app is a is a small, mid-range local band. Okay. That tours around, and can survive because in each city, a hundred people come to their concert, hmm. and they have enough money to move their gear around in their van to yeah. the next city, uh, and then you have. The Rolling Stones and U2 and, you know, the big, big, uh, uh, big venue bands that, that are like Marvel feature films, so right? So it's like Disney Plus. Well, Disney Plus would be, yeah, like, like, like I guess that's still technically uh, untested waters because the streaming service hasn't started, but Disney, Plus Disney is a big can't, one. can't falter at this point. But yeah, you have a hundred of these little apps and you're like, ah, niche fans want their niche programming. Yeah. And it's a thing that, that can survive on its own, mm. more or less. I suppose, like, yeah. like a small touring band that is not a household name. Yeah. A show you've never heard of can exist on an app or a streaming service that you've never heard of. Yeah. 
and survive completely outside of the bubble uh, all on its own because it has its little core of audience. Although you look at like Community, that got, that got uh, moved to Yahoo Screen. Community. All new episodes, streaming free, Tuesdays, only on Yahoo Screen. That failed streaming service that lasted like a year, nobody watched it. It was a good season too, but it's like, so you have that happen too, where now it's just like, everybody has a streaming service. I, it's interesting because I think broadcast television, like traditional broadcast television, is like the news, <laughs> the, the Bachelor, Dancing with the Stars, yeah. soap operas, and the news. Yeah. And it's not like edgy, interesting shows. It's not like, you know, your Orange is the New Blacks or your Russian Dolls or shows like that. Yeah, yeah. They're not, they're all on streaming services. And then when something is good on, a, on regular network television, it, it will die because they don't advertise it. Yeah, and then like it an moves, AP bio. Moves to a streaming service, yeah. Exactly. AP Bio, which looks visually like like a, a mean-spirited indie movie. Right. It's like, yeah, it's not going to last long on NBC or it, whatever it, it's it, on. It doesn't look like a sitcom. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't have the vibe of a sitcom either. Um, Even something like The Office, which was successful and on for years, like that's still, you know, it was shot like a documentary or whatever, but that still felt like a sitcom sure. in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. which that's leaving away from Netflix. Yeah. And they're saying Netflix is going to tank when that show leaves. That one show. That's it's why important. I always joke about how it's the, 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 the uh, office streaming network. Uh, huh? Yeah, it, it'll be interesting these, these next uh, two decades <laughs> uh, of uh, when, when entertainment sorts itself out. We, we talk That's the thing is like this is the Wild this. West right now with all these different really streaming is. services. Some come and leave immediately. Some have you know, stuck around. Like Netflix has been like top tier for so long, but now they're saying that's on the verge of collapsing. It could. Now we got Disney Plus is coming. Uh, Apple is having their own streaming service that they're dumping a ton of money into with like Steven Spielberg is bringing back amazing stories. And there's like all these other original programming that they're making and you're just like, oh fuck, it's too much. It's too confusing, yeah. especially for the elderly. <laughs> like us. But yeah. Yeah. They're just gonna watch the news and The Bachelor. <laughs> I think that's all they watch anyway. Dancing so it's probably okay. Yeah. And also a fascinating thing too to note is the human brain gets fuzzy and frustrated after it's given more than 12 choices. That's, that's what they always say with like, if you, you pull up a, like Netflix or something, you know, you, you spend too much time browsing around and your brain just clouds over. I've, I've discussed this before on our show, I think. that I mean, that's why I've liked the red box. Because there's <laughs> limited amounts of things in there, and you go, ah, ah. And I'm you know, watching. at least half of them are garbage, yeah. so that limits your selection right. even yeah. more. But you go into a grocery store or a regular store, and you're looking at more than 12 types of toothpaste, then you, you get, like, your eyes glaze over. <laughs> If you have six, you can make a choice. Yeah. Nine, you can make a choice. Anything under over 12, that's what, that's what studies have shown the human brain just starts to shut down mm -hmm. because it's like, I, I don't want to think about this. And that's kind of where entertainment is. The audience will decide. Yeah. And you have an, the NBC app or the, the Disney app will probably survive because Disney it's, will be just it's fine. got the yeah. strength behind it. But you have the network apps, the CBS, the NBC, those kind of apps. Will they survive? Will, won't they? Will people pay 10 bucks a month to get the NBC app? There's a lot of great shows on NBC. Will someone make the effort? Because that's another thing too. With TV, you turn on the TV and you flip the channels. NBC's there. Yeah. You have to go through a process mm -hmm. to put the app on, to sign up for it, to put your credit card in and pay for it. To well, log in and then your password doesn't work and you have to yes. reset your password. The, and, and when you're asking <laughs> a consumer to do more work, yeah. you just knock down 90%. <laughs> you have to make it easy for people. Yes, that's true. And cable is easy. Mm -hmm. When, when you have to go download the app to your TV. I, go I the, gotta go to the, what's the app store? And I, I gotta create a password for this too. <laughs> gotta, so will, will the consumer do that to watch two shows they like off yeah. a network? Ah, collapse, collapse, <laughs> success, fail, success, fail, collapse. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. It'll all work itself out. It's like shaking a big thing of water. You shake that and eventually it'll even itself out. And you can't predict anything. No. 
other than the Disney Plus app will be successful. <laughs> you predict that. And that the Picard show will suck. And that the Picard show will suck. <laughs> Those are the two. Death and Taxes and the Picard show will suck. <laughs> Engage. Oh, all this, all this Comic-Con stuff is just like miserable. It's just like exhausting to talk about. Let's talk about something that isn't quite so miserable and doesn't make you feel quite as bad. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about Ari Esther's new film, Midsummer. <laughs> that lighthearted comedy. <laughs> I mean, it is lighthearted, right? Because it all takes place during the day. Right. It's literally light. I told you that I want to go to that festival in Sweden. No, you said it would be cool to go. Yeah, and then I got the opportunity and I decided Look, I to do it. I don't mind you going. I just wish you would have told me. That's all. Uh, so we watched Midsummer. It's been out for a couple weeks now. Yeah. We, we weren't going to do a video on it because I think we were both just sort of like, eh, on it. Um, which is an odd reaction to a movie with some pretty fucked up stuff in it. <laughs> but we are, already saw Hereditary and so we were prepared for it and it was just kind of more of what we were expecting. Um, yeah. But then after seeing it, we kind of have kind of kept talking about it. It keeps coming up in discussion. So it, like, it, yes, it's definitely something that you will talk about. Yeah. Um, in both a good and bad sense, because Hereditary, uh, while I didn't care for the ending. Oh, see, the I love the ending. I've actually, that's a movie that I've actually grown to like more over time. Sure. But the thing about that movie, uh, we're just going to say spoilers. This movie's been out for a couple weeks. Everybody's talked about it. Uh, so spoilers for the whole thing. But what I loved about Hereditary is that it kept, like, surprising you. Like, every 20 minutes, every half an hour, it would just veer in a new direction. Uh, so you didn't know where it was going. And that's, for me, that's important with a horror film. Uh, with this movie you always kind of knew where it was going right from the beginning, right from the premise. It's like, oh, this is the guy who made Hereditary and is about people that are going to, it's a cult movie, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. The weird thing is, I saw, I was uh, made aware of an interview with Ari Aster where he was explaining that the movie is sort of, it's allegorical, it's literal in the film, but it's also like on an emotional level, the movie is allegorical for uh, an elongated breakup. It's a, a, an operatic breakup movie and, um, and a, a dark contemporary fairy tale. Mm. A couple that, where the relationship is basically over, but they're still together and it gets dragged out. And the actual cult aspect of it didn't interest him. Hmm. Which is like, the movie's about a cult, and if that's the part that you find least interesting, maybe don't make the movie about that. He's very weird. I can't pin down this Ari Aster. Yeah, and a lot of it too comes down to the trailers. I wish I didn't see the trailer for Midsummer. Yeah. Uh, the trailer for Hereditary was like vague and creepy. Well, that's the thing is, is spoilers for Hereditary. I was not expecting that fucking little girl's head to get knocked off by sure, a telephone pole sure. 20 minutes into the movie. Yeah, or the satanic cult yeah. at the end, which, uh, you know, like it or hate it, whatever. I was just like, eh, okay. But the, I mean, What's her face? Uh, Tony Collette, uh, powerhouse performance. Great performance. Yeah, uh, held that movie up. Yeah, like tremendously. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and then this, it's a it's a different animal altogether. One because you didn't you had a, a pretty A B C trailer. Yeah, uh, spelling out the plot. We're going uh, we're going to this uh, Swedish ritual. We're anthropologists or whatever. Yeah, college uh, students. And yeah, we're gonna. Uh, we're obviously all from America, and we're going to this weird thing in Sweden that we're not familiar with. Um, and creepy, creepy things are gonna creepy happen. Creepy things are gonna happen. Uh, this will not end well. Yes. Uh, and then that's exactly what we get. Yeah. Um, but it, what I said right after seeing it is that it was a more sophisticated Eli Roth movie. Mm. So many of his movies where someone you know goes to a new environment and bad things happen, and they're all kind of douchebag characters. No! 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 no, no. A big problem, like the movie looks great. I, I love the atmosphere of it. I think the most effective stuff in the movie is the pre-credit sequence. 
because that's what establishes that their relationship is basically over. You know, mm -hmm. she's talking to her boyfriend on the phone and he's very like distant and she's like, are you coming over tonight? And he's like, oh, did we have plans to, well, no, but I thought maybe, and it's like, okay, there, there, there's a disconnect there. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and then that leads into, of course, the stuff with her sister and her parents. And All the most interesting stuff. A, 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 yeah, the, the super emotional stuff and it's really effective. And then the rest of the movie plays out basically like how you would expect. The twist of the movie is that she, the main girl, I don't know that actress's name. I thought she was very good until the last half hour of the movie when she just makes a frowny face. She got drugged or something. She makes that for the entire rest of the movie. And that's another problem too, is everybody's drugged out of their minds. So they're very like passive and nobody has any agency. And so you can't really like fault the boyfriend for cheating on the girlfriend because like he's out of his mind on drugs. Yeah, I mean, so there's that stuff. He Everything made the just choice. Kinda... He made the choice to drink the mind. She, the girl says it will, it will make you uninhibited. Yeah. And he's like, he's, he basically does a fuck it and yeah. drinks it. So, uh, first of all, they've already seen some pretty fucked up stuff. You're not drinking that shit. I, yeah. So I, that's I, a I problem would, is the disconnect with the characters there. I would not take any mind altering substances. F, yeah, after seeing some of the things they see, but also the uh, the idea that yeah, he's kind of an asshole boyfriend, but he's not like. He's not abusive. He's just kind of like aloof and dumb. <laughs> I, I, you know, I understand what they're going for, but I don't think he quite deserves the fate he gets in this movie. I understand the point of it. And that's the frustrating part is like, I get it. I get everything you're doing, but I don't think the characters were fleshed out enough to make it really uh, impactful. See, if he was the, the, the dickish movie boyfriend, you should shut up, you know. You can do it subtly, you don't have to. I think it would be too on the nose that he got burned alive in a bear carcass. <laughs> um, I think it was more like, see, that's why this movie's fascinating. Yes, you get everything that's happening. The subtext is the relationship stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's less about the boyfriend and more about the, or so I saw it, the girl kind of becoming powerful. Well, not just powerful, but also having some emotional support because that's what she's lacking through the whole movie. Her sister is, you yes. know, her sister's distant. Her sister, you know, kills herself and their parents, which yeah. is shocking. Uh, she has this aloof boyfriend that doesn't really care about her. So then as the movie goes along, she finds the emotional support she's always been lacking with this with community. The cult, yeah. There's that great scene where... Uh, She's like wailing and crying and all the other uh, women in the, uh, oh, yeah, the they tribe, imitate they her. start imitating her. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay, she, I, I have found what I've been lacking my whole life yeah. in this group environment. Yeah. The, so it's like, I have to literally burn my old life down. Mm -hmm. What am I going through? We just need to acclimate. I don't want to acclimate, I want to go. Those early scenes when she's She's desperately trying to contact her sister. She's using Facebook and email yeah. and you know modern things and uh, calling her parents, leaving a message on the answering machine. Nobody Try, trying to reach out to nobody people. listens to her. She reaches out in every way possible, both technologically and verbally. She shows up at that apartment where all the dudes are hanging out and they don't really like her. That was a great scene so too. Awkward. The subtlety of the awkwardness was yeah. was really well done. So she's not literally screaming at the top of her lungs, but she's doing it in the, the way she can. Mm -hmm. the, while the boyfriend is not on the nose bad boyfriend, he is in a way because he's spineless, he's aloof. Not he's emotionally supportive not in emotion any way. He's very selfish because at one point he, uh, he tells Chidi, I'm, I'm, I'm taking over, I'm also doing a pro, no, I'm taking over, I'm also doing my thesis on oh, this cult, yeah, I'm just yeah. taking that from you. Yeah. I know you were doing it first, but I just feel like doing it I want it to do too. it too. And he doesn't care about other people other than himself. He was a very realistic character. Um, not movie bad boyfriend character, just a realistic, like, kind of like a blank slate, a flat line of a human being. Kind of, kind of like most people? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Doesn't have, doesn't have the guts to tell her, like, you know, I don't want to be your boyfriend anymore yeah after three years yeah and it's just crazy um and so you, you don't really he doesn't deserve to be burned alive in a bear <laughs> carcass but at the same time it's he allegorical kinda, he kind of does yeah and, and, it, and you kind of have this feeling of like meh when he when he dies at the end yeah that's the thing is like and i guess maybe this is what the movie was going for i wasn't i wasn't emotionally invested and i wasn't shocked i was just sort of ambivalent as it went along where i was like okay i get it yeah. You know, towards the end. Um, but then you have like all the, 
a couple of sub characters, like the the kid from Where the Millers. Oh yeah, who, who was the original choice for Pennywise in the new It movies? Oh, back when it was Carrie Fukunaga was doing it. Yeah. Uh, he um. He, you know, he's just like dude bro kind of guy who wants to party in Sweden. He doesn't really know where he's going or he, what he's, he's getting into. He's the closest into. to an Eli Roth character, just done yeah. more realistically. Yeah, and he accidentally pisses on the ancestral tree. <laughs> um, and all these characters, they get killed off, but it's all off camera. Completely yeah. off camera. And so it's like, are you commenting on like American culture coming into some kind of sacred ceremony? But it's a fictional ceremony i'm sure yeah there there, is there's a... i know i i read something about ari Esther did a lot of research and there's a lot of elements of the ceremonies that are based on real things sure. but obviously you know twisted and a mashup yeah, yeah. Uh, of lots of different cultures ritualistic ceremonies i right. guess but so is it is it commentary on that that's sort of snuck in there a little too but then it's also about a relationship on top of that it's, it's there's a lot going on and it's really fun to talk about yeah and it's a and not uh, I, I i feel bad because it's a good movie mm -hmm. uh it, to me it's just after hereditary it feels like it, it feels mildly disappointing trust me all right then you have that other element of the handful of characters from the U.S. that come there and they're doing the research. The kid is dude bros, pissing on things, and a, we're we're not respecting this 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 ancient ceremony. Yeah, you have we're, the one that goes into the sacred book and he's like taking photos of it yep, at night. Yep. That was cheating. the sacred texts. The sacred Jedi texts. Oh. Yes, the sacred texts. <laughs> <laughs> written by someone who's inbred. Yes. Always have to be inbred. Well, that's another aspect that felt underdeveloped, because that's like the, the famous image at the end of the trailer is the kid yeah. with the fucked up face. Like, the first time they show him in the movie, it's just like an extreme close-up, and it's so disconnected from everything else. I was like, is he there? What is happening? It was it was odd. Yeah. Um, I, I have expected the girl that dollar store Chris Pratt was having sex with was his somehow his sister yeah because they bring up the incest stuff they, they they're like it has to be and then they the 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 old lady the matriarch character was like we've selected you to mate with her yeah and and, and then they have that reverse close-up yeah he's having sex with her and they reverse close-up and they their eyes look very similar mm -hmm. and I was like oh somehow he had a long lost sister and it's a little corny that coincidental yeah. um all those things or but it could be that the 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 one kid that's from this group that went off to college like sought him out he sought him yeah, out yeah. i don't know maybe that was all cut out but it was it made sense other than just he's just yeah. having a baby a random baby the, the 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 nuts and bolts of how the ceremony works why they do certain things Ah. Well, it kind of falls into that trap. We talked about this with us, how it's like there's what the movie is sort of allegorically about and then the literal story. Right. And it, it's there's almost too much literal stuff where you do start to question the logic of it. Right. Even though it's not really what the movie's about. And the, the literal stuff in this is more realistic. The, yeah. The, the, the literal stuff in us went so... Off, it's off the just charts. Bizarre, yeah. Where it's like, now, okay, <laughs> literal part of my brain shutting off. Sure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna enjoy the metaphorical stuff, the below ground, the above ground, the, the society allegories and all that. I'll enjoy that. I'm shutting my literal brain off. Sure. This you couldn't do both. Yeah. And also, to me, a lot of it is that all the side characters kind of fall flat. Sure. You know, the uh, not Pennywise, <sighs> like he's kind of one note comic relief character. Um, the main girl is is interesting in terms of what she's going through, but as an actual character, kind of eh. Right, I, and I, I, again, like, sort of like Hereditary, where you just want that main character to do something at the end. Yeah. The, and the kid at Hereditary just sort of like zombily walked into that satanic ceremony and became part of it. It's it's like a it's a very dour kind of. Uh, bad feeling ending. Uh, Ari Aster, he's well, a sick fuck. <laughs> and he likes those kind of, you wanted. But the problem is, especially, and it, it's, you know, you want to look at a movie on its own, but it's hard to watch this and not think of Hereditary, where it's it's doing a lot of the same things. Like, yeah, where the characters are very passive by the end. I was just going to say that, it's passive horror. Yeah, there's, there's uh, severe head trauma in both movies. There's, uh, 
uh, obviously a cult aspect to it. There's dummies or figures made out of actual corpses. That's it. So it's like, it's kind of the same elements, just kind of put in a different yeah. scenario. There's things he likes to put my, in. My initial movies. thought after seeing it was, it was like kind of like the horror version of Wes Anderson. Yeah. It's like when you watch a Wes Anderson movie, you know exactly what you're going to get. They're not bad movies by any means. They're good. And even in this, the big barn that everybody sleeps in, like basically the whole movie is painted out in all the little uh, drawings that are on the wall. So not so much, uh, I'm talking about the visual style, but more so the, the repeated elements where it's like, okay, mm -hmm. You gotta, your, your next movie after this, you gotta really shake things up. He's gotta go right to Fast and Furious 9. That's true, yeah. Hobbs he needs and to be, Shaw 2. He needs to be recruited for a big dumb blockbuster now. That's Our how it goes. And that's, that's one of the positives I'll say about this is like, this got a pretty wide release and it's, yeah. it's an original movie, uh, you know, technically. I mean, it, it reminds you of like Wicker Man and a bunch of other stuff, but it's not a part of some big property but it got a pretty wide release, and I we walked into the theater, we walked right past, right next to it was Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's pretty good. That's something like this is still, you know. Theaters have not become the uh, Disney uh, exhibits. Not completely. There, there's still a little hope for, for a bizarre little kind of slow moving movie like Disney this. Disney theme park yeah. theaters. Yeah. Uh, that's the eventuality. But at least the, uh, this is a horror movie that isn't like another Annabelle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, so we didn't see that either. Annabelle comes home. No. Who gives a fuck? Annabelle, uh, go home. <laughs> no, yeah, done with, uh, done with that. Yes. Done with that. I, I, I can safely say I'm, I'm grateful that Ari Aster is making films. Because yeah, well, that, that's the thing is like, yeah, it, it, you know, he's, he's making very, sp nobody else is making movies like him mm -hmm. right now. So at least you still have that, that director's voice. An original voice. Even if it's not perfect, that the Midsummer, uh, you have that original voice who has, who has his own thing. That's why I'm excited that there's a new Quentin Tarantino movie coming out. I feel like he's the last of movies that get released on a wide level that a lot of people go and see that actually do well financially that feel like somebody's vision and somebody's voice. I joked that it was called Bad Trip to Sweden or <laughs> um, Bear With Me. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Like, there's so punny, punny titles you can make. In movie. I was most excited for you to come. Good performance by the lead actress until she turns into a frowny face for the last half hour. That's her entire performance, which that combined with the giant flower costume is, it's like I said, borderline comical. And then having the boyfriend in a bear costume is like, I mentioned the Wicker Man, but like the Wicker Man remake, he's in a bear costume in that. What is it? What's wrong, sister? And the last thing you want to be reminded of in, a, in a, a serious allegorical horror film is the Wicker Man remake with Nicolas Cage. At least there were no bees. Uh, no, not the bees. Not the bees. Oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! Oh, my eyes! 